hosts are each going to take a few minutes to speak a little bit, um, and then we're going to have a question and answer session, and you can learn a little bit more about how you can stay safe while staying involved and active online. Um, and if you have any questions, just save them for that question and answer time, or you can tweet them to us at ONA Mizzou. So, take it away, guys. Okay, hi. So, I would like to start off by saying that I am an admitted oversharer. I err on the side of sharing, much to my husband's chagrin, and someday my kids are going to say, what are you talking about? There are like pictures of me being potty trained on the internet. I have no idea how that's going to shake out in 15 years. <laughs> They're really going to hate it someday. Um, but I, am, I embrace what um, social media has had such a positive effect on my relationships, on my relationship to the world around me, on my career, that I'm a big, big fan. So I would also like to say that I, the reason I'm comfortable sharing is because I make really good use of privacy settings. So if you have accounts that do not, Facebook specifically, let's start with Facebook. If you do not keep track of what you're sharing to which kinds of people, you're missing an opportunity to open up about, about um, what you're able to share. So I have a lot of other journalists who I hardly even know who send friend requests because we've, we've become collegial and we like to stay in touch. I met them at a conference once and there's the friend request and it would be rude to say no. And I use Facebook as a combination of work and personal. So I add them to a list on Facebook called Don't Know Very Well. And my default posting on Facebook is to all of my friends except the people on the list called Don't Know Very Well. So when I post pictures of my kids, they don't see it. So there are three ways that I post on Facebook. The most private is everyone except the list Don't Know Very Well. Actually, the most private would be the list I have of just friends of really, really close family. So I have something to say that I don't need the whole world to know. I do that. The next private would be everyone except don't know very well. The next one would be all of my friends. The next one, because I enabled the new feature on Facebook called subscribe, where people can follow you sort of like on Twitter without being your friend, I have 5,500 people, I think, who have somehow found my public updates worthy to subscribe to. So those people don't get to see hardly anything about me. Um, when I take a look at Google Plus is also really, really great in your Google profile of keeping track of who can see what. And you can actually preview and say, show me what this profile looks like to this specific person. So you can check and make sure that my cell phone number isn't there, that my address isn't there, or that my work information is what shows up. I am lucky that I have never had anything happen online because of my social media sharing that has made me uncomfortable. I have been uncomfortable because of how we just live on the internet. There was a commenter at the Missourian this fall who got really mad and has a history of being really mad at people at newspapers in town, and he happens to be a private detective. So I knew that when he was mad at me, that meant he knew where I lived and where my husband worked and where my kids went to school. That made me feel uncomfortable. That is not a product of social media, unless you consider online comments social media, which actually I do, because I have a pretty broad definition of what it means to be social online. Um, but that was not because of things I've shared, that's because of public records. Um, so privacy settings will get you only so far. A protected Twitter account will get you only so far because anything you post can be reshared. Screen grabs can be taken. Even if you have a protected Twitter account, people can copy and paste what you tweet <coughs> and put an RT in front of it and send it back out. So some people think that by, be, by um, limiting your account, which I think hurts you as a journalist to, show, to be completely private about what you're doing. Um, that does not protect you from people seeing what you share. So if you use, the place that I'm the most careful is mobile. And if, I'm a big Foursquare user, I like to check in. That is really protected. I do not accept you as a Facebook, as a Foursquare follower unless I know you personally and feel really comfortable with you knowing where I live because I'm sure at some point I have checked in in my neighborhood or somebody else has checked in and said Joy's house, right? So. I'm very careful with that, and my Foursquare updates do not go to my, Foursquare, my Facebook and my Twitter. So mobile, I think, is the most important. Um, the reason I think it's so important to not rely on privacy settings is because you can't control what other people do with your information. You also can't control what happens when their phone gets stolen. If I, put, if I share where I live, and you are a friend of mine, or I share that I'm on vacation because I trust you to know that I'm on vacation, and your phone gets stolen, all of a sudden, the person who stole your phone knows
knows, we do have a friend named Joy in Columbia, Missouri, and in Columbia, Missouri, who's on vacation. Um, so I do sometimes post that I want vacation. And I probably really shouldn't do that. Um, but so privacy settings cannot be careful. Be careful with that. The, other, the only other thing I'll say by way, uh, two other things I'm going to say by way of introduction here. One is that there are apps that automatically enable a GPS component. Google is about to unveil, you've probably seen this week, new privacy settings on Google. If you go to Google's dashboard, it will show you the apps that they pull information from that now we're all going to talk to each other. So back when Google was announcing this product called Latitude, that's sort of a check-in thing that tracks automatically where you are. If you've ever signed up for that, only that app used to know, and now all Google apps are going to know that. So if you go to Google's dashboard, you either like 20 apps that I have at one point played with that have to do with Google services, and now I can say, I'm going to delete that one, I'm going to delete that one, because now they all talk to each other. Um, but like on Twitter, I don't have my Twitter set up to automatically add a location when I tweet, partly because it's really none of your damn business where if I say I'm having a sunny day, I, I don't want that to be automatic. If I want to say it's a sunny day at Stevens Lake Park, I would say that. I don't want it to happen automatically to say, because you know, if, it, if you enable that, it's going to show a spot on the map, not just say Columbia, Missouri, but it's going to show where you are. Plus, when you lie to your boss and say that you're sick, and then you say, <coughs> cough, cough, and you're doing it from Wrigley Field, then which is probably not great for you. Um, the last thing I'll say is that you need to update this. Whenever you get browser updates, go ahead and do it, because a lot of time browser updates have to do with security and protecting the data that you enter, which is a little bit different than um, the idea of what we post, but keep your software up to date. Opening tips. Hello, I am Sergeant Jill. It's actually Schluty now, but that's really con confusing to everybody because... Really? Congratulations. Yeah, it's since it's October, but the city has weird things about email, and so apparently if you try to change your name on your actual email, it causes major catastrophes or something. So you're going to get an email that says it's from me, but then in the signature line, it's not going to say the same person. So it's still me. Well, can I ask a question then from a sure. journalist's accuracy standpoint? If we're quoting you in print or online or on air, what is the proper name that you're like to be using? I am Sergeant Schluty. Okay. And you'll want to be specific. Do we know that? Does Missouri say, know that? Oh, yeah. yeah. We've been doing it right? Yeah. Um, I think most everybody has been. But I'm Jay. You'll want to be sure and say Jay or Jill, and that's because my husband is a sergeant as well. And so he could be, he could Sergeant be Schluty either me, one. and he doesn't want to be me because he, <laughs> 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 he doesn't want my job at all. So, um, that's kind of just a clarification, but I would never be offended. It is not hyphenated. God, no, I'm not finding what it usually be. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so she brought up, brought up a lot of really, really good things. And what I'll say is, from a crime standpoint, I think what people have to remember is, is uh, law and law enforcement is always about 10 steps behind, and I'm being fairly generous, technology and how criminals use types of things. So... By the time, you know, 50, 100 people have been victimized, it might pop into somebody's head that, hey, maybe we need to look at a law or something to address this. And computer and internet-based crimes specifically have been really problematic because there's not a lot of statute that addresses it on the state level. Um, we find a lot that um, when we have harassment cases, um, it's very hard to establish jurisdiction and that's really important in law enforcement because if you don't have jurisdiction over the place where the crime was committed, you have no lawful authority to enforce the law. So, and that sounds kind of odd, but that's one of the very first things you have to establish when you're trying to make a criminal case. Do you have jurisdiction? So, if something isn't addressed under state statute, it falls to the feds, and then it's kind of in a black hole sometimes. Um, they're really overwhelmed. So. It's hard for us to address sometimes computer type crimes that fall into this, uh, and that's really why. So that's why you've seen a little bit more emphasis when you see the bullying things that happen on social media and things like that. Lawmakers are trying to address it. Uh, the problem is there's there's usually always some kind of weird loophole, and it sounds really great to say you can't bully over social media, but that doesn't make it easy, any easier to serve a search warrant or subpoena on Facebook. Trust me. Um, that's a really, really long, hard process. Um, I will say, I think there's been some fairly high-profile um, social media-related crime 
Congress here in Columbia lately. We had uh, the student that gathered some photos, the high school student that gathered some photos and then posted them on a Facebook page under a fake name, and they were actually of minor females. Um, and that's kind of been very problematic for us on many levels. Um, two things you don't ever want to lace together is juvenile law and law involving the internet and harassment because it's very problematic. But uh, beyond that, you know, right here on campus, we had some people that were getting contacted via Facebook uh, for the request from someone who was posing to be an alumni of a sorority and trying to gain information, get into the Facebook profile, and then they were uh, basically what I would classify as extortion, um, telling the ladies, hey, if you, you know, if you want to get in, they, they found out who was rushing different sororities, and they would say, hey, if you want to get into, you know, Sigma Chi, whatever, um, you'll get your webcam out, or you'll do this or that or the other, and some people, you know, were doing it because they thought that it was part of the process, or where they were divulging information only to find out that this person was not who they said they were. And actually, that person was victimizing people here. I believe that I talked with the uh, one of the chief at uh, University of Tennessee. Um, I think I got a call from someone in Florida. It was really kind of widespread over the southeast Texas. So it, it does happen. And I think some of the best advice that we, the law enforcement gives is, don't be too trusting. Uh, I saw a really interesting study recently that says people who use Facebook, especially people that use it multiple times a day, are 43 times more likely to trust people in general. And so that kind of says something about the person that goes into Facebook. And it, I mean, just the act of being on Facebook is fairly social. It kind of says something about how you like to connect with people. I mean, Usually if you ask somebody, hey, do you have Facebook? It's usually like, yeah, why would you ask that? Duh. Or they're like, oh my God, no, I would never turn on Facebook if you paid me. So it kind of says something about us, I guess. But, um, you know, we do have a harassment <coughs> statute in, in Missouri that was recently updated. Prior to the 2010 legislative session, harassment was only defined as in writing or in person, and they broaden that a little bit to be any electronic communication, so it doesn't just have to be phone calls or letters, it can be email or Facebook or whatever now. So that's about the closest tool we have. Still kind of weak, um, it's not a felony usually, so. Um, it, it's tough, it's a tough thing for law enforcement, and we're, we're kind of at an uphill battle because most of us aren't 22. This is not something we're extremely familiar with. We're having to learn the technologies we go to, so we have to go to training to learn how to use it, to learn how to investigate it, to learn how to prosecute it, make a good case, and that's a long process. We're already behind the curve from the other people. I will say, um, I, I think it's, I think we would be naive to think that criminals aren't smart enough to get get on Facebook or something. I, I'm amazed at the amount of people that have no security on their accounts. Um, and I say that because I've personally looked at criminal suspects and found information on their Facebook page. And I'm like, uh, really? Wow, that's amazing. Not that I'm mad about it. I'm, I'm grateful that they don't know about the security studies. But everybody else, I want to use them. So, and the, this check-in thing is great. I mean, I every time it comes around when it's a break for you guys. You're going to hear me, and it's not like a broken record. Oh, there she is again, talking about security settings on your social media stuff. Because I don't want to see, uh, Joy just checked out at Cancun, Mexico. You know, and I'm sitting here going, oh my God, and everyone knows that Joy lives over on Wilson Avenue, and now we're going to investigate the burglary over there in about <laughs> seven days when she comes back from Cancun. I, and I, I can guarantee you that's happening. So just be very vigilant about keeping private things private and don't think for a second that you're just going to get lost in the shuffle of all the thousands of people because there are people out there that it's being more and more used against us I guess. Hi there. <laughs> I'm going to kind of do a little what I do, some facts, some ways we respond on campus and then a brief what to do but I'm really going to leave it more to your questions and things like that, because I could spend hours on this. Um, my name's Danica, I'm the coordinator of the Relationship and Sexual Violence Prevention Center, RSVP Center, at RSVP Center on Twitter, that's my name. Um, <laughs> and we, we 
see the intersection between stocking and technology all the time, um, daily. I can say that uh, with confidence now. And um, the majority of my job has to do with intervention, um, with sexual violence, relationship balance, and stalking. So I'm not spending too much time on stalking, but um, typically if... deal with all the public's open records for the police department. So I'm extremely aware of what you can get legally. So I'm even more narrow about what I give out free because I know someone can go to the clerk's office and find out where my house is. Sexual violence or relationship violence is happening, stalking is happening as well. And if there are students on campus, the population I work with, the stalking is happening online, um, sometimes in person, but primarily online. And there are a lot of ways that people can get information online. Um, and I can go into that more if you'd like. Um, we've talked about quite a few of them here, even, even just your webmail. The online campus directory, things of that nature. I mean, I've got some links that I could pull up if, if you want those later. Um, since we haven't really said stalking, I want to kind of give you a frame for what that is. So, stalking is defined as a pattern of behavior that would cause a reasonable person to feel fear. Okay, it's a pretty broad definition. And I mean, if you were watching that video um, when you came in, I can't even watch it, you know, I, I feel fear watching that. If those are my pictures up there in that guy's bedroom in his computer, in his car, um, that would make me fearful if I knew things like that were happening. Um, we know that, let's see, 80.3% of female campus stalking victims know they're stalkers. So this isn't a creepy stalker guy jumping out of the bushes or a person you don't know, this is someone um, Folks are in a classroom with, or um, their friend, <coughs> or acquaintance, somebody that they met at a party, a bar, study group, you know, wherever, in line at the bookstore, um, some kind of acquaintance, and typically, or current former partner, um, those kinds of things, friends, coworkers. More than one in four victims reported some kind of technology used to stop them. Okay, so this. This is happening, and this is kind of an outdated, this was 2009. I'll argue that it's a lot higher now, especially on a college campus. Um, Jill kind of touched on what the city does. We do work with campus police as well, MUPD. And um, primarily, like when we talk jurisdiction, the way we handle that is if somebody is receiving these you know, threats or constant um, Facebook requests or messages, on campus, if they're opening that on campus, it'll be campus jurisdiction, unless we you know, find reason to put it somewhere else. It's gonna be campus jurisdiction. So we work with MUPD a lot on these, these issues, and um, if it's student to student, we're working with the Office of Student Conduct if the student wants to uh, go through that process. And if law and law enforcement is, as you say, 10 steps behind, our code of conduct is light years behind. It hasn't been open since 1987. What? So there is none of this in our code. There's room for it, so we can, of course, still do something about it, but it's not, it's not where it needs to be. Hopefully, things will be changing soon. I can say that, but you can see how difficult it is to get in front of the conduct committee and say, this is a problem, fix it, and say, well, it, it fits here, sort of. Um, that said, we, we do have um, a lot of success working with these issues and getting folks held accountable. Um, typically, they know what they're doing is wrong. It's not some, oh, I thought it was fine, I thought we were friends kind of situation, so um, typically they'll agree to the sanctions that are proposed, if you will. Um, and then for every technology, there's a counter technology. So that's a good and bad thing. Um, if we are doing our homework and, um, you know, I'm no expert, I won't pretend that I'm the end all be all, especially when it comes to technology, I don't have time. I can't possibly keep up with it. Um, that said, I know where the resources are. I know the people who are spending the majority of their time working on this. 
So if someone's coming to me and saying, I'm getting this call and it looks like it's from my mom, but when I pick up the phone, it's not my mom on there. What is that about? I can say, okay, well that's, that's a spoofed call and we can install this to try to fix it. Um, all kinds of different things. Again, I've got pages of stuff that we can talk about if you want. Um, so then my little what to do piece, I'm not gonna, you know, I know that we've got all of the ways to protect yourself and those kinds of things, so how I will frame that um, and sum that up is be proactive, make sure that you're you know, staying educated about all the different updates, and um, these women definitely gave some great ways to look at that. So anything that you're on, make sure that you know and fully understand it before you're utilizing it. Um, and then protect your friends. All right. Um, when they are trusting you with their information, make sure that you are using it um, as responsibly and appropriately as possible. Okay. That can be friends, um, you know, acquaintances, whatever. Um, even the people, you know, I'm talking to journalists, so the people you're writing, writing articles and stories about, make sure that you're protecting them as well. Um, that, that speaks volumes that you're being respectful there. Um, and then if you see something, say something. The typical bystander intervention piece, um, of course I'm talking green dot here, if you know what that is. Um, so if you see something that makes you feel uncomfortable, something happening on somebody else's Facebook wall, Twitter feed, whatever, say something about it. You know, hey, that's not cool, that's not okay. Why are you doing that? Or to your friend, did you notice that? I felt really uncomfortable when I read that. They might not have thought of it, or they might think everybody else thinks it's no big deal, so they're going to downplay it. Um, or they might just not want to talk about it because they are so scared of letting somebody else know what's really going on there. When that person likes every single thing, you know, every single status, every single picture, that might seem really cool and really sweet, but they know that that's their way of saying, I'm looking at you, I'm checking in on you, I know where you're doing. So, um, I don't want to like bring it down, but <laughs> that said, you could just be a real asset to your friends by saying something um, when you're noticing something. And trust your gut, you know? We have that there for a reason. So, I think that's how I'll wrap up with my official portion. Do you mind if I say a couple yeah, more things? Go for it. So, as the journalist here up on the panel, there's some great ideas here. And the stat that Jill mentioned, I don't remember what you said it was about how much more likely you are. 43 times more likely to trust people. To trust people, right? Mm -hmm. So journalists tend to be really open. We tend to think information should be free, right? Like, of course, we want people to tell us things all day and we say things back all day. So here are some things I've observed in journalism students. Posting all by myself in the box office in the middle of the night. <laughs> and thinking that's a cool public update, right? Not so much. Um, assuming that other people, I love what Danica said about respect and the privacy of sources, you know, that we, we, of course people think it's cool if we tag them in the story we just wrote about them, right? Well, maybe they don't want that. There's this great Facebook privacy setting that, uh, that disallows people from checking you in with them. Like if I check in at the movie theater, you can tell in your settings, you can't check me in at the movie theater. I get to decide if I'm gonna let the world know where I am. Also, journalists, I see a lot of student journalists using their cell phones for interviews, which is unavoidable sometimes, and yet get a Google Voice number or something where you have a number you hand out that's private that is not your personal number. So do you guys know about Google Voice? Mm -hmm. You need a number that is not the same number your mom calls that you can turn off at certain times of day, that you could disable if you needed to. When you call a source who might be mad at you, there is no chance that source should have your personal cell phone number. Um, and then just in terms of, of people being comfortable, I took a phone call this summer. This woman was in Columbia visiting for the Show Me State Games. She and her kids were out walking on the trail and chatted up a Missourian photographer who was perfectly clear about the fact that he was a Missourian photographer, took her picture, got her kids' names, right? She got home to her small town in northern Missouri, totally flipped out when she realized that meant her kids' names and pictures were on the internet. We live in a world where everything we do is published on the internet and where it's a really good thing that if you Google my name, you can find something about me because we are social people 
we track, you know, that's what we do. I don't know if this woman had a really, really great reason to not want her kids' photos and pictures on the internet, like a, a specific person, she really didn't want to know where her kids were, or if she just is of the culture that you really don't want anything about you to be on the internet, but she was asking me to take the photo down, which we can't do, because we don't unpublish things that are, you know, once you're published, if we took every request from somebody to say, hey, I'd rather not, not be in the newspaper, can you take it down, please? You can't do that. And yet, it's a really good reminder for me, I keep thinking about it, but six months later, that not everybody we talk to, we need to make sure people understand, and you know, I know that, I think our student journalists in general are really fantastic about saying, and you know I'm from KOMU, you know I'm from the Missourians, and that means that I'm writing something here that will be published. That once that's online and searchable, it's a totally different thing than you appeared in the hometown paper on one day. And all this to say social is not bad. Okay, it is absolutely not bad, especially inherently not bad, and can be used for wonderful things. Um, and I would never tell someone, even a survivor I'm working with, to just, oh, well, just get off Facebook. You know, just don't be on Twitter. That's, that's not practical right now. They wouldn't make that choice great. But um, let's just figure out a way to do it as safely as possible. Awesome. Does anybody have any questions? There's a comment. I mean, uh, Facebook hit end of 2005, early 2006. I think we were the first two faculty members on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, I was on the, I, we, it, this became, this privacy thing became a big deal to the point that there was a proposal to ban mm -hmm. Facebook on this campus in you know, the education school. Uh, and so there was a task force that I was
pictures of your grandkids. So what? I got pictures of my grandkids, you know, posted on uh, bulletin boards all over. You, you know, the grandkids are mine. So I don't care if they see it. Now, if it's a picture of my granddaughter standing naked in the bathtub, I'm not going to post it. I'm not going to post it. I'm going to embarrass it. So if it's something I'm proud of, I'll post it. I sometimes think maybe I've gone too far, and I think your point We would all make the point. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, that's one thing I was going to ask. How, how often does someone actually burglarize a home because they heard that that person is not not there? Someone has seen it on Facebook. Well, I think the problem we have is number one, you have to get the suspect to admit that's how they knew, which mm -hmm. they generally don't want to tell us anything. And if they're smart enough to find it out on Facebook, I'm betting they're smart enough to invoke their the right to counsel. <laughs> so um, we usually don't have much luck there. Um, the other problem is too is us making that connection. But some of the larger departments that do that a lot quicker, you know, they're a lot quicker on the technology stuff. They're just starting to see it as a, a trend. And I'll be honest, I if someone had the time, if we had somebody at the police department that had the time and the knowledge, it'd be interesting to go back and look and see the rashes of burglaries that we had, how many of those people posted. And we may never know because it would literally require the suspect to tell us, yeah, that's how I found out. It would always be just kind of an inference otherwise, but it'd be interesting to know. Well, the reason I say that I think we were dealing with this whole idea that people uh, thought information was free, there is no real privacy. And now, sharing each other's information. I mean, I may not know that Joy has a stalker. Maybe we go out to Tonic on Friday night, but is that that, is that bar even still exist? I don't know. I don't know. Wait, I have a name. It may not. Quentin's, I know, is open. I know it's open. Um, but I may not know that you've had a problem with somebody, you know, sending 5,000 burn requests a day, and so I'm checking you in here and there and doing all this, and and then I get home and realize my path around the city yes, has been traced right. or something like that. And, you know, I think it's it's one of those weird things. To me, and this is like cop Jill kicks in sometimes, to me it's weird to think that somebody could sit at their house and just, you know, labor over looking and trying to find all these things because a good, I've heard two really good kind of, similar things to think about. You know, it used to be we would have somebody that, okay, this person's a sex offender. We don't let them be around kids. We don't want them to go within a thousand feet of a school or Chuck E. Cheese or whatever it is. And now, we, that we, they don't even need that. I mean, that's kind of a joke. And you can say anything you want about locking them out of the internet or anything else. If they want to get on the internet, they're going to get on the internet. And so they have access to all these victims all over and they can coerce the victims into coming to them. They don't have to go outside their bracelet area. And that that is very strange when you think about it from a law enforcement perspective. It makes us kind of feel... But those guys can also hack the privacy. Not that hard to hack the privacy. Sure. It, the, the, same, the same thing about the privacy things to me is I'm going to hope that when everybody in here leaves their house, they lock the doors and they lock the windows, right? I don't leave my house in the morning and go, well, hopefully my flat screen will be there when I get back. You lock the doors and windows. 
you don't just leave it open and let everyone on your name. Now, it does happen on East Campus all the time. <laughs> but most people don't leave their doors and windows unlocked or people just randomly walk through their house. But we do it with our security systems. And you're really, the amount of information, I mean, talk to police detectives sometimes that's savvy with that kind of stuff. We can get a lot of information. And if we can do it, and we're crappy, we're crappy with that kind of stuff. I mean, we don't, I'll tell you straight up, we don't have any computer social media gurus at the police department. There's force, folks on Internet Crime Task Force that we go to, and they help us. But if we can do it that easy, imagine what a private investigator can do or somebody. I mean, there's there's people in this building right now that I'm sure. But I think that's what you get to the point of. <laughs> if you've got something to hide, hide it. Really well, well and that's kind of my default. Person, if you're going to use social media, that's really my default. I mean, I tell people all the time, and I'm going to be very specific about, do not take photos of yourself and send them to other people. And you know what kind of photos I'm talking about. Because that's a perfect example of it. You know, people have brought up, once it's on the internet, it's there. I, I, get, I bet I get a call a week from someone I got arrested and nothing else happened with it. The prosecutor dropped the charges. I want my name off the Tribune's website. And I'm like, I want a lot of things off the Tribune's website. <laughs> <laughs> so you're preaching to the choir. No, I'm not really. But you know, it's that kind of feel. And it's the same thing with pictures. As soon as you hit send, you know, publish, live, whatever, it's gone. It is completely out of your control forever. And someone can take that picture and do whatever they want to it or send it to anybody they want, or put it in a big book of stuff they're going to sell to some other weirdo someplace, mm -hmm. and it's gone. And, and that seems really overly dramatic, but we see it happen a lot in law enforcement. Pictures that you never would have imagined would end up in a public place, end up in a public place. Let me add to that, as journalists, the, the, if it's on your phone, you risk the, the possibility of you having it on your phone by the state when you're working as a professional. Yes. It's happened in my news. I saw things I did not need to see, and it was a horrifying experience, and and not what I wanted. And be smart about it. Once it's digital, you you risk yourself if you're using if it's on a tool that you use as a professional, you risk the possibility of you by mistake letting it out when it shouldn't be let out. So just don't do it. Well, and photos. We haven't mentioned this yet, but photos, especially on smartphones, iPhone, all that, they're geotagged. So there is location information on that photo, where you took the photo, at least. So when you're uploading that to Twitter immediately, you might not have the location piece enabled, but if that information is still on that photo, people can extract that really easily. So you might not be saying you're in Mexico, but you know they can tell pretty quickly that that's where you are and things like that. So that same path around the city at night you might think you've got it locked down, but unless you disabled that feature on your phone, it's still out there. There was a hand track there while we yeah. were talking before. Jill, do you have a Facebook account? I do. A personal one, and I don't let anybody see it unless someone is my friend, and I am not friends with anyone at work except public information officer. Maybe your and husband. husband? And he doesn't have a Facebook page. Uh. In fact, we're probably going to have a co one. Because I'm just a big, I'm kind of in that weird in between, in between place because I have cop Jill on this side pulling me over into the don't ever do anything, post anything, and then I have public relations Jill over here on the other half pulling me into, you know, because everybody in Columbia has my cell phone number. It's on my business cards, it's on the website. So I'm kind of in between, I'm torn about it. He hates that kind of stuff. So I think we're going to have a code, but honestly, the only thing we use it for is to share pictures of family. I mean, I just don't, I don't think my life's that interesting. I don't really think anybody cares what I'm doing, so. Well, my husband is a police officer, too, and we, in October, we both um, got off the Facebook and we're not on it anymore. Um, and he's, the reason he was because of the work relation and um, never knowing when he would have to go on case and court and everything like that, so that information can always be proven. Yeah, there's some really interesting, um, you know, there was a, a situation not too long ago in New York where some officers put
posted some pretty inappropriate things about um, a minority group in New York. Uh, it surrounded a, a yearly parade or something that they had there. And the, literally some court cases got thrown out over it, you know, because it kind of made it sound like these people might be willing to plan evidence. And, and maybe they never would have done that in a million years, but yet they said things in a social media setting that defense used again, as, you know, as well as their right, to use against the officers. So that's why I'm pretty, I'm pretty blase. Like even if I, I tell people I have one and I say, yeah, but nobody can see it. And I think then they think, oh, I wonder what she has on there. Like you'd be really, really <laughs> bored. Hey, I painted my living room today. And here, I mean, it's really, it's boring, so it's not that great. But because of that, you know, I just don't. And I think sometimes I'm probably the most public police officer in Columbia. So I think I feel like sometimes I have more of a, higher likelihood of someone just being curious and wondering. What kind of content is dangerous? Well, you know, I think what's dangerous for me might be different from them. I mean, I, I used to work undercover narcotics, so I don't know who's still mad at me. Some of them are probably still in prison, I hope. But who's to say someone doesn't decide one day they're not happy about the 15 years they spent locked up and they go looking me up? Um, you know, so to me, it might be different for them. Um, to, and I, I kind of have a weird deal too, because 